Medical Service Company developed a one-of-a-kind CPAP monitoring program called Compliance 2020. Compliance 2020 is an industry-leading and innovative approach for supporting patients throughout their journey with PAP therapy. What makes Compliance 2020 unique is that the program coaches a patient through three distinct pathways, an adherence pathway, a clinical pathway, and a therapy rescue pathway. Compliance 2020 engages and connects with patients on their terms using either voice, email, or text, along with self-help communication options. At MSC Sleep, we have learned that as a patient begins CPAP therapy, it is essential to communicate early and often. Through Compliance 2020, patients receive no less than six outreach notifications or encounters within the first 30 days of therapy. To learn more about MSC Compliance 2020 program, visit medicalserviceco.com. Good afternoon. I hope you are enjoying the day, this day of continuing education. I will be introducing Dr. John Carter, who will provide the last sleep lecture of the day. Dr. Carter is a sleep neurologist, also known as a neurosomnologist. Dr. Carter participates in the Metro Health System in Cleveland, Ohio. He has been with Metro Health since 2017 following his residency and fellowship in neurology and his fellowship in sleep medicine at the University of Washington. Dr. Carter's specific focus and interest include sleep-related movement disorder, parasomnia, hypersomnia, and novel treatments for obstructive sleep apnea. We are grateful to Dr. Carter for participating in our 21st Annual Education Forum and hope you enjoyed this lecture, Things That Go Bump in the Night, an introduction to parasomnia. Hi, I'm Dr. Carter. I'm a neurosomnologist at Metra Health. Uh, neurosomnology is where neurology and sleep medicine come together. And so that means that I take care of patients who have neurological sleep disorders. And today we're gonna to talk about some very interesting neurological sleep disorders called parasomnias. Parasomnias essentially are weird behaviors that happen when we're asleep. And the definition that we officially use uh, for parasomnias is what you see here, which basically is an undesirable action or experience that happens when we're going into sleep, when we're asleep, or when we're waking up from sleep. And uh, when I, as a sleep doctor, am thinking about parasomnias, I tend to categorize them, as you see here, into these three categories. So you have your non-REM parasomnias, which are parasomnias that happen during REM sleep, your REM parasomnias that happen during REM sleep, and your other parasomnias, which is uh, basically anything else. And this categorization is helpful because there are important differences between the parasomnias that happen in non-REM uh, versus REM in terms of what they look like and in terms of how we treat them. And so we're going to try and talk about as many of these today as we can. There are something like 15 different parasomnia diagnoses that we deal with in sleep medicine. And if we run out of time, um, then we'll talk about anything else next time we give this talk. So when I'm thinking about parasomnias, it's really important for me to know what stage of sleep they're happening in. And many of you will be familiar with stages of sleep if you're a sleep tech, if you're a sleep provider. But if you're unfamiliar with sleep stages, the way we look at sleep is based on the brain's electrical activity. So we monitor that with EEG. And the way the electrical activity looks tell us, tells us what's going on in the brain and what stage of sleep we're in. And there are really important differences between the different stages. And so what you're looking at here is non-REM sleep. This is what's called non-REM stage two sleep. And non-REM sleep is really the calm, gentle waters. So if you're a sleep professional, you'll say that there's a low frequency EEG with K complexes and sleep spindles and slow roving eye movements. But you can think of it as calm, placid waters. The brain is 
slow, the activity is synchronous and harmonious. And that's different from REM sleep. REM sleep is sort of the turbulent, windswept waters. And when you're looking at the brain activity in REM sleep, you're seeing a lot faster activity. It almost looks like somebody is awake. And if you're a sleep professional, you'll say that there's a high frequency uh, EEG without K complexes with uh, uh, different grapho elements, including uh, 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 rapid eye movements and uh, low chin tone. But again, it's reasonable to think about REM sleep as the windswept choppy waters. And so the fact that the brain activity is so different in these stages of sleep means that the different kinds of behaviors, the different kinds of parasomnias that happen during these different stages of sleep are gonna look different and we're gonna deal with them differently. So when we map out the sleep over a typical night, uh, it looks something like this. And again, the sleep professionals will be familiar with this and we call this a hypnogram. But the basic idea is that the brain moves through sleep stages as we go through the night. And as the night goes along, we get a little more REM sleep and then a little more and a little more and a little more. And so if somebody's having REM parasomnias, these tend to happen closer to the end of the night because we have more REM sleep. And similarly, if somebody is having non-REM parasomnias, those tend to happen closer to the beginning part of the night because that's when we have more non-REM sleep. And similarly, there are sleep disorders and other um, unusual behaviors that can happen during the transition between wakefulness and asleep. Um, nocturnal movement disorders are an example restless leg syndrome, rhythmic movement disorder, nocturnal seizures uh, tend to happen when we're transitioning between these different states, uh, either falling asleep or waking up from sleep. So the timing of when these behaviors are happening is really important. When I'm seeing somebody in clinic, it's really important that I know, you know when are these unusual behaviors happening and we rely on spouses and bed partners to, to tell us that most of the time. But the definitive answer to this comes from uh, the EEG and from the polysomnogram, the PSG, or the sleep study. And what is happening during parasomnias is that there are overlapping brain states. The brain is a little bit awake and mostly asleep. With the non-REM parasomnias, it's a little bit awake and mostly in non-REM. With the REM parasomnias, it's a little bit awake and mostly in REM. And it turns out that different parts of the brain can have different activity at the same time. So little parts of the brain can be awake even though most of the brain is asleep. And most of the brain being asleep means that we don't remember what's going on, but those areas of the brain that are active can still make us do things and experience things. And that's how these parasomnias happen. And so it turns out that there's a, a tiny little part of the brain uh, that is responsible for most of our sleep regulation, meaning whether we're awake or asleep and whether we are in non-REM sleep or REM sleep. And that is a little teeny tiny part of the hypothalamus, which is this little uh, bit of brain tissue. Uh, you can see it in red here at the base of the brain and particularly a little piece of that hypothalamus called the ventrolateral preoptic nucleus is responsible for basically telling our brain whether to be awake or asleep. And when those signals get crossed, that's when we can have parasomnias. And it turns out that if we map out the circuitry of the parts of the brain that keep us awake and those that keep us asleep, it essentially serves as a switch or a seesaw. And when that circuitry tips in the direction of keeping us asleep, we're asleep. And then when it tips in the other direction, we're awake. And there are very complicated mechanisms that tip the seesaw in one direction or another, but the end result is we're either awake or asleep. 
And it turns out that there's a similar switch or seesaw that controls whether we're in non-REM sleep or REM sleep. And if we map out these switches in a little bit more detail, uh, we get something like this. And the idea here is that there are large distributed networks in the brain that are communicating with each other constantly. And these networks are sending signals to each other and are always in balance. So the parts of the brain that are working to keep us awake are also sending a signal to the sleep parts of the brain to turn it off. And when that signal is strong, we're awake. When that signal becomes weaker, then our sleep drive becomes stronger. And eventually we reach a point where the sleep drive is strong enough to tip the seesaw in the other direction, and then we're asleep. And then the sleep parts of the brain are sending signals to the parts of the brain that keep us awake to turn those off. And as that signal is strong, we stay asleep. And as that signal gets a little bit weaker, we tip more in the direction of waking up. It turns out that there's a similar sort of idea in the parts of the brain that control REM sleep versus non-REM sleep. There are a little bit different parts of the brain. They utilize a little bit different neurotransmitters, the chemicals in the brain uh, that send signals from uh, different parts of the nerve and, one, and from one nerve uh, to another. But the basic idea again is that REM and non-REM sleep are two distinct stages and the brain can flip from one to the other. Now, you would be absolutely right in asking, well, if the brain is asleep, even if a little part of it is awake, how do we get the complicated, complex behaviors that we see in parasomnias? So an example of this complicated behavior would be sleepwalking. How are we able to navigate uh, around the house, around the bedroom, uh, down the stairs, into the kitchen when the brain is asleep? And it turns out that there are pieces of the brain that are organized to control complicated behaviors uh, with a very small number of nerve cells. And these are called central pattern generators, which means that you really only need to turn on a small part of the brain to produce a pretty complicated behavior. For example, you can turn on a small part of the brain to uh, start speaking. It's not gonna make sense, but you'll still be speaking. A small part of the brain can uh, control movement of the leg and hand. It can control chewing and swallowing and eating and breathing uh, and, and even walking. And so that means that when the brain is in this intermediate state between being awake and being asleep, when it's overlapping, uh, it doesn't take much to activate one of these small areas if the little part of the brain that's awake happens to be one of these central pattern generators, then you're going to get some kind of behavior, some kind of movement, some kind of action, and that's how parasomnias happen. So let's talk a little bit about the specific parasomnias. Some of these uh, everybody's going to be familiar with, uh, sleepwalking, nightmares, uh, but some of these are unusual and important to know about, particularly if you're working in the sleep clinic uh, or in the sleep lab. And this talk really is geared towards the general public, but if you're a sleep tech, if you're a sleep provider, uh, I hope that you'll still get something out of it. So as I mentioned, uh, our official categorization of the parasomnias is, is as you see here. And this is the order in which I'm going to talk about uh, the different parasomnias, the different types of parasomnias in this talk. And so let's start with the parasomnias that happen in non-REM sleep. So when I as a sleep doctor am thinking about is this an, a parasomnia or not, 
uh, I am referring to uh, specific guidelines that are laid out for us in a, a manual that is known as the uh, International Classification of Sleep Disorders, uh, the ICSD. And in order for something to officially be a parasomnia, it has to meet all of these various criteria here. It's not really important that you memorize this unless you're a sleep doctor, but just understand that these are the kinds of criteria that we're thinking about when we're evaluating a patient, either in the clinic or in the sleep lab. If you're a sleep provider, uh, this slide is for you. So the non-REM parasomnias, sleepwalking and confusion arousals and things of that nature are fairly common, but there are uh, certain predisposing factors that uh, can make them more likely. There's a particular HLA haplotype, the DQB10501 that you see here. There are certain polymorphisms of uh, chromosome uh, 20. Children uh, and some adults with developmental delay and intellectual disability are much more likely to have parasomnias. We don't really know why that's the case. And people who have a sleep movement disorder, particularly restless leg syndrome, are much more likely to have uh, parasomnias. When we're thinking about what makes it more likely uh, for a parasomnia to happen, uh, there are really three uh, uh, processes um, that I think are important to think about. One, if we have more slow wave sleep, more deep non-REM sleep, what we call stage three uh, and what we used to call stage four uh, sleep, we are more likely to have non-REM parasomnias. And it turns out that if we are sleep deprived and then go to sleep, we're gonna make up for that sleep deprivation with more slow wave sleep. And so people who are falling asleep after a period of sleep deprivation are more likely to have parasomnias. And that's a totally normal thing. Secondly, if you are impairing the brain's ability to wake up, then you are more likely to end up in a state in between wakefulness and sleep. And so some of the medications that we use uh, to help people sleep, we call them the Z drugs, uh, things like Ambien, uh, Lunesta, Sonata, et cetera, uh, basically make it a little more challenging for the brain to wake up. That's how they help us fall asleep. But if something wakes us up, if we have a sleep apnea event, if we have a, a leg movement from restless legs, if a sound wakes us up, but we're not able to wake up the brain fully and we end up in that sort of in-between state, we're more likely to have a parasomnia. And a well-known side effect of many of these sleep aid medications is sleepwalking, which is one of the more common types of non-REM parasomnias. And thirdly, anything that fragments or disrupts our sleep uh, is more likely to put us in this in-between state between wakefulness and sleep. So things like sleep apnea, periodic limb movements or restless leg syndrome, even stress uh, has been shown to increase sleep fragmentation and make it more likely uh, to have parasomnias. So <clears throat> what do parasomnias look like? Well, you know, if we, if we graph them out, it tells us a lot about what's going on. And what you see here is um, on the x-axis, the uh, time in minutes, and on the y-axis, the level of arousal from waking up to moving around to really being distressed uh, the higher you go. And if you just wake up, but you really don't get out of bed, you really don't move around. That's what's called a confusional arousal. Now, if you wake up a little bit and the body begins to move, if you start walking, if you get out of the bed, that is called uh, sleepwalking or somnambulism. If we have uh, a very high level of emotional distress or autonomic activation or autonomic arousal, uh, that's typical for a sleep terror, 
and uh, these are fairly common things uh, in children, uh, which are really kind of terrifying to watch, but um, typically quite benign. Um, so uh, children wake up uh, out of sleep, incredibly distre uh, distressed, crying, uh, screaming, uh, but they're still asleep. Um, uh, most of the brain is still asleep, but enough of the brain is awake to produce this behavior, particularly uh, what we call the limbic parts of the brain, the, the parts of the brain that control emotion, um, especially uh, fear. So uh, when somebody tells me what happens uh, when uh, they're having this weird behavior or their spouse tells us uh, what's happening when they have this unusual behavior, it's helpful to think about um, uh, the behavior in this sense, to kind of graph it out and get a sense of what we're dealing with. We call this behavioral semiology. What does it look like? So let's talk about some of these specific parasomnias. So one of the more common types of parasomnias that happens in non-REM is called a confusional arousal. And this happens when a, a part of the brain arouses. We're not fully awake, but enough of the brain is activated to, uh, uh, to get us to sit up in bed. Uh, we may uh, speak. Uh, we may kind of look around be confused and uh, disoriented. And if that then progresses to getting out of the bed and walking around, well, that's sleepwalking. So confusional arousals and somnambulism or sleepwalking really are two points on the same line. But we think about them differently because, well, there's a big difference uh, between whether you just wake up, look around, and go back to sleep, or whether you are getting out of uh, bed and walking around the house. There's certainly a, a different level of uh, danger and risk in those two different situations, even though the underlying cause is essentially the same. And so in a confusional arousal, you're looking at a cycle uh, such as what you see here. So typically, uh, people are in slow wave, uh, sometimes called delta wave sleep. Something disrupts that, causing an arousal. Maybe it's a noise, maybe it's a leg movement, maybe it's a change in breathing, causing that sudden arousal. Uh, we then have the behavior, uh, speech disorientation, moving around in bed. But because most of the brain is still asleep, we uh, don't remember uh, this event. Uh, we have amnesia to the event, and then we fall back asleep. So let's see what one of these events looks like. Where is he? Who? The holes? What holes? How much more do we have left? Not too many. Okay. Ready to bed? Yeah. Come on. Okay. So what you saw there is a very typical confusional arousal. So he's lying on the couch asleep. Something wakes him up. You see him start moving. His hand starts to move. Um, his uh, partner uh, uh, starts talking to him and he responds. But the way he responds doesn't really make uh, any sense. Uh, he seems confused and, uh, and, and disoriented. Um, as the conversation continues, he begins to wake up more and then finally sits up. So that progresses from a confusional arousal to a full-on awakening. Um, if we're in the sleep lab, uh, it, it might look something like this. So uh, this particular patient here is in slow wave or, or delta sleep. Uh, you can see on the, uh, the bottom uh, lines in purple here, we are uh, monitoring uh, his breathing. And uh, if you're a sleep tech or a, a sleep doctor, you'll recognize that he has a respiratory event uh, right around the middle of the screen, a, a little bit before and uh, suddenly has an arousal. Uh, 
Uh, he starts moving the lines uh, uh, get uh, really close together um, the uh, the tracings are starting to go uh, to, to go crazy and that's because he's uh, he's moving around um, and uh, it turns out that the sleep tech uh, noticed uh, this guy was flapping his hands and uh, and quacking like a duck so very unusual uh, behaviors but this is actually a confusional arousal that was prompted by a sleep apnea event. And that's very common. We see these sorts of things in the sleep lab all the time. And uh, very often, if you treat the underlying cause, if you treat the sleep apnea, uh, they may go away. Now, confusional arousals are very common in children. Uh, they can happen in adults as well, although uh, they don't happen with nearly the same frequency. Essentially, Confusional arousals are universal in young children uh, under five years of age, and they become less and less common uh, as we get older. But up to about 4% uh, of adults will have uh, fairly regular uh, confusional arousals, um, although typically these don't uh, cause too many problems. Now, that being said, in people who have frequent persistent confusional arousals, uh, there is a, a fairly significant likelihood of other uh, mental health uh, or medical health problems. For example, in people who had persistent confusional arousals, about half of them had some level of anxiety. Over half of them reported uh, feeling depressed. Uh, a little under a quarter of them had a diagnosis of bipolar disorder. And about 13% of them had obstructive sleep apnea. So although confusional arousals on their own are not particularly worrisome, if I'm seeing an adult patient who has very frequent confusional arousals, uh, I'm uh, going to be looking for underlying causes that are triggering that and paying particular attention to consequences because, uh, you know, these data show us that these uh, frequent confusional arousals may certainly result uh, in symptoms. That being said, we almost never treat these. Uh, you want to make sure that uh, the sleep hygiene, uh, the sleep habits, and the sleep routines are optimized. We want to avoid sleep deprivation, again, because being sleep deprived will give us more of that N3 uh, sleep, that stage three or delta wave sleep where confusional arousals and other parasomnias are more common. Similarly, we want to follow a regular sleep-wake pattern. We want to make sure that the brain is moving through the sleep stages in a predictable and consistent fashion. Changes in uh, those sleep stages can precipitate or prompt parasomnias. We want to limit exposure to things that can uh, result in what's called central nervous system depression. That doesn't mean a diagnosis of depression. That means things that kind of tune down the brain. For example, sleep aids, alcohol, uh, things of that nature. And of course, if people have other sleep disorders, sleep apnea, restless leg syndrome, uh, we want to get those treated. Now, if a confusional arousal gets us out of bed, that's called somnambulism or sleepwalking. And what that tends to look like is there's an arousal in the brain. Part of the brain wakes up, although most of the brain is asleep. We get confusion and disorientation and automatic behaviors, kind of funny movements, exactly the same as you would see in a confusional arousal. But then we get what's called locomotor activity. We are moving around. Now, sleepwalking is very common. Again, much more common in children than in adults, but it certainly happens in adults as well. Um, the typical age for this is uh, young, early school age kids between four and eight uh, years old. Uh, but teenagers can have sleepwalking, adults can have sleepwalking, although it's less common as we get older. Um, typically, episodes of sleepwalking last only a few minutes, but long Longer episodes certainly are possible. Uh, 
Um, and very complicated behaviors can happen uh, during an episode of sleepwalking. So sleep eating, uh, uh, you know, sleep uh, going down the stairs, sleep driving, uh, sleep-related sexual activity, etc., uh, have all been described. Um, the underlying cause uh, is the same, but again, the part of the brain that is activated, um, if it happens to be one of those central pattern generators that we talked about, is going to result in a fairly wide spectrum of these complicated uh, behaviors. You know, there have been some kind of high profile cases uh, in the news over the past uh, few years uh, of sleep related violence. Uh, thankfully, this is extraordinarily rare, uh, but this is some uh, something that we uh, on occasion do see. Um, this is an example of, uh, of sleepwalking uh, in the sleep lab. On the left-hand side, you see this uh, patient. This is a, a school-age kid um, who's in a deep, uh, slow-wave sleep. Um, that's shown on the EEG in the middle. Um, and then there is uh, a sudden arousal uh, manifesting by an increase in the chin tone, the muscle tone, uh, which is measured here by a little electrode on the chin suddenly shoots up, so that's an arousal. But if you're monitoring the brain activity, you see that he's still asleep. Um, and then uh, as the episode progresses, he sits up, which is what you're seeing on the right-hand side of the screen, and he ended up getting out of bed and uh, walking towards uh, the door. In this case, uh, because he's in the sleep lab, uh, this sort of thing is caught and the sleep tech uh, was able to redirect uh, him. But um, this is a child who had a history of sleepwalking episodes uh, at home. Uh, let's look at some other videos of a little more complicated uh, episodes of sleepwalking. So sometimes people with sleepwalking have behaviors that are a little more unusual, are difficult to categorize. And these are the cases where we really need the evidence from a sleep study to tell us what's going on. So this is a, a gentleman with a history of sleepwalking. And um, during this particular event, he was in N3 sleep. We know that by the EEG. And he described a, a vague sense of a, a truck uh, swooping down on him. So let's watch this. Okay. So in that video, what we saw is uh, he started out in deep sleep. There was a sudden arousal, uh, followed by what we would call a rapid displacement from the bed. He leapt up uh, quite quickly. Uh, he got sort of tangled in the wires, uh, so he didn't make it that far. And then he seemed uh, very confused. Uh, he was speaking French in this video, but um, uh, you know, asking, uh, you know, where am I? What's uh, what? What's going on? Looking around, appearing vaguely confused. And then he slowly makes his way um, to the bed and gradually pulls up the covers. And if we look at the EEG, he's asleep all the way up to the point until he's getting back into bed and pulling on the covers. At this particular uh, point, he's, uh, he's awake again. But all of that complicated behavior, leaping out of the bed, looking around, occurred when the brain was still asleep. Let's watch another video. This is a young lady who has recurrent sleepwalking. Um, during this episode, she was also in deep stage three sleep. And when the sleep tech uh, asked her about it uh, later, she reported vague uh, dream material, but nothing really specific. <laughs> 
So it just so happens that, uh, that this patient has a history of sleepwalking, but what we're looking at is actually much more typical for a um, confusional arousal. She doesn't make it out of the bed. It's not sleepwalking, uh, but you see a sudden arousal and she sort of ducks and, and covers her head and then you know sits back up again, looks around, is very confused and disoriented. And again, throughout this entire episode, uh, the brain remains asleep. Now, treatment of somnambulism, of sleepwalking, really boils down to safety. Uh, if uh, someone is walking around the house, uh, opening up the kitchen drawers, turning on the stove, uh, you know, grabbing knives, walking out the front door, getting behind the wheel, uh, these are major safety concerns. So we think a lot about environmental safety, and this includes all the things that you see listed here, um, locks on exterior doors, and particularly um, locks that you can't open easily, so uh, high up uh, on the door, uh, locks with uh, codes on them, uh, uh, child gates on staircases. Um, certainly, if there are knives or guns in the home, you want to make sure that those are very safely secured. Um, I've asked patients before to remove knobs from the stove uh, when uh, they had sleep cooking uh, and sleep eating. Um, if they have injured themselves before, we can pad uh, sharp edges of, uh, of furniture. Um, there are alarms that you can put uh, on doors and uh, windows and things that uh, when they go off, they'll wake uh, the person up and, and end the, uh, the sleepwalking uh, episode. Um, you can also try something called scheduled waking. Um, this really only works if the sleepwalking or other behavior is happening at a predictable time, um, particularly with children. Uh, but if there's a time of the night uh, or a range of, of time where the sleepwalking typically happens, you can wake them up uh, a half an hour or so before. And uh, for whatever reason, that uh, scheduled waking seems to uh, reduce the likelihood of, uh, of a parasomnia later on. Um, there's some evidence for psychotherapy or hypnosis. I personally have uh, not recommended either of these things, but there's some literature supporting uh, their use. And like anything else, you want to avoid things that can precipitate uh, this. Again, sleep deprivation, certain medications, uh, drinking alcohol before bed, etc. In very rare cases, we may treat these with prescription medications. The only cases really where I will uh, treat sleepwalking with a prescription medication is if there's a significant risk uh, to the patient uh, or uh, you know to a bed partner or a family member or, or what have you as a result of uh, of the sleepwalking. For example, I had uh, I have one uh, young patient who uh, has a feeding tube, uh, and uh, during his confusional arousals, he would very frequently pull out the feeding tube. Um, and uh, this was a particular feeding tube that went quite deep um, into the intestine. And every time he pulled it out, they had to take him to the hospital to get it put back in. So uh, that's certainly a, a, a case where uh, the risk uh, of the, uh, the sleepwalking was high enough that we decided to treat it with uh, medication. And the typical go-tos there, if we do decide uh, to treat it, are the benzodiazepines, uh, which are uh, sedating medications, and uh, clonazepam is the most commonly used uh, of these. Um, sleep terrors are, uh, are particularly interesting type of non-REM parasomnia. These tend to happen in, in children. And uh, if uh, anyone who's a parent uh, has witnessed these uh, in their children, uh, they are very disturbing, uh, really, um, really quite terrifying. Uh, and uh, what typically happens during a sleep terror is uh, the child will wake up, usually uh, sit uh, bolt upright. Um, very often they're crying, uh, screaming, they may be thrashing around, fighting, uh, uh, that sort of a thing. Uh, but throughout all of this, the brain is, uh, is still asleep. And very often attempts to calm the child down result in the opposite. 
they uh, they end up getting uh, uh, more upset, um, particularly if uh, we try to interrupt the behavior to you know shake them or jostle them to wake them up. Um, that typically makes things worse. Uh, the best thing to do uh, in these cases is wait it out. And again, in sleep terrors, what's happening is a small part of the brain uh, in what's called the limbic system, particularly the amygdala, uh, is activated even though most of the brain is asleep, and that results in a fear response. This is an example of a sleep terror seen on a sleep study. Uh, this particular child is in uh, deep uh, slow wave or, uh, or N3 sleep. Right around where you see that star uh, on the page there, uh, there is a sudden uh, arousal, this buzz of brain activity, even though the brain is still asleep, uh, this sudden uh, muscle movement uh, here in the chin and in the legs, and uh, the child begins crying and screaming. Sleep terrors are fairly common. Uh, up to 6% uh, of children will experience sleep terrors at some point. Um, they're quite uncommon in adults, less than 1%, but they do happen on, on rare occasion. On the sleep study, as we saw, the typical finding is arousal from stable N3 sleep, followed by sympathetic hyperactivation. The heart rate shoots up, the blood pressure shoots up, um, uh, the child uh, or, 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 or adult becomes, uh, you know, very uh, upset and um, very often, uh, these don't need any particular treatment. Um, we want to ensure, uh, just as with uh, sleepwalking, that the environment is safe, that if they're thrashing around, that they don't injure themselves. But typically, reassurance um, and good sleep hygiene are the mainstays of treatment. In very rare cases, again, scheduled awakenings and uh, low-dose benzodiazepines can be used, uh, but that is certainly not common. So when we're thinking about sleep terrors versus nightmares, uh, the two can certainly look similar. But there are important features that can differentiate sleep terrors uh, from nightmares, um, particularly when they happen, uh, what happens during the event, and uh, whether the event is remembered or not. So this is not a slide that you need to memorize uh, unless you're a sleep doctor or a sleep provider. But the important take home point here is that sleep terrors happen in non-REM sleep. So they tend to happen in the first part of the night, whereas nightmares happen in REM sleep and therefore are a little more common in the uh, latter part of the night. With sleep terrors, uh, typically kids don't remember them. However, with nightmares, it's very common that uh, the dream material is remembered. Um, when awakening from a sleep terror, it's very common to be confused or disoriented. After awakening from a nightmare, uh, very frequently you're fully back to normal, scared, uh, but not particularly confused or disoriented. And so if someone is telling you about uh, these, uh, these episodes, these particular features can be helpful to distinguish between uh, a sleep terror and a nightmare. Now, one particular type of non-REM parasomnia that uh, is important to know about and uh, sometimes needs treatment is something called sleep-related eating disorder, uh, SHRED or S-R-E-D. And this involves essentially making and eating uh, food uh, and even non-edible substances during sleep. Now, there are other types of conditions that uh, involve eating around bedtime, uh, but the only one of these that actually happens during sleep is sleep-related eating disorder. And so sleep-related eating disorder is a parasomnia 
whereas these other conditions are not. And these other conditions are number one, evening hyperphagia, and number two, night eating syndrome. Evening hyperphagia uh, essentially uh, means uh, eating a lot after the last meal. So uh, you have dinner, the kitchen's closed, and uh, suddenly you're uh, raiding the, uh, the, the fridge again. But uh, during these episodes, you're fully awake, cognizant of what's going on. Um, and during night eating syndrome, uh, people actually consume more than half of their total daily caloric intake in the late evening or during an awakening from sleep. And what people will typically experience during these episodes is that uh, they, they go to sleep, wake up at some point in the middle of the night, find themselves ravenously hungry, and uh, then raid the kitchen but uh, they're awake, uh, cognizant, and alert while that's happening. Um, that's different uh, from sleep-related eating disorder. During sleep-related uh, eating disorder, uh, you're fully asleep, uh, and uh, therefore it is a, a, a parasomnia. Overall, this is rare, but in people who have uh, eating disorders of any kind, um, uh, it's a lot more common, up to about 16% of those populations. And um, when we work with people who are pursuing uh, weight management surgery or bariatric surgery, we actually hear about uh, these types of night eating problems very frequently. Um, and it is important to dif differentiate between the parasomnia, sleep-related eating disorder, and the non-parasomnia, evening hyperphagia and, and night eating syndrome, because the treatments are different. Um, on the sleep study, if you happen to capture one of these episodes, there's a classic finding which is known as rhythmic masticatory muscle activity, uh, RMMA, uh, which is essentially rhythmic chewing, and I'll show you an example of that. Um, the treatment typically involves, again, environmental safety. Lock up the cabinets, lock up the drawers, take off the, uh, the knobs from the stove, uh, that sort of a thing. Similarly, you want to treat any precipitating uh, uh, conditions. Uh, it turns out that restless leg syndrome has a very strong association with sleep-related eating disorder. Uh, it uh, causes arousals from sleep that then prompt the sleep walking and then the sleep eating. Um, and in some cases, it can be treated with prescription medications. Most commonly, I will use uh, topiramate. One interesting point uh, to know about sleep-related eating disorder is that the type of things that people eat during these episodes are often uh, bizarre and, uh, and somewhat unusual. Um, I had one patient who put peanut butter on uh, a carton of cigarettes. Um, it, you know, it's unfortunately usually not salads that people are preparing in the middle of the night. Okay, this is an example of that rhythmic masticatory muscle activity, the RMMA, um, the rhythmic uh, motor uh, activity uh, and EMG that you see uh, throughout the chin leads as well as the EEG. All right, we're wrapping up with other parasomnias. And these are uh, somewhat unusual, but important to know about. Uh, so exploding head syndrome. Um, this is a particular favorite of mine. Uh, patients with this particular uh, condition will wake up suddenly with the experience of hearing a loud noise, hearing a snap or a crack or a pop inside of their head and feeling like their head is exploding from the inside out. But very interestingly, as soon as they wake up, they don't have any pain at all. So this is not a type of headache. Um, we think that this may be what's called a hypnic hallucination, an auditory hallucination. In other words, the brain is creating uh, the this, uh, this sense of uh, sound uh, that then wakes us up. Typically, uh, these are entirely benign, and so uh, reassurance is the most common appropriate therapy. But in rare cases, when this is happening very commonly and causing problems, uh, it, it may be appropriate to use prescription medications, and uh, some of the options are shown in the list here. <laughs> 
Sleep in uresis uh, or bedwetting uh, is very common in kids who are under five years old. And so we only diagnose this as a disorder in kids who are five uh, or older. And we call, uh, call primary enuresis uh, when uh, the patient has never been dry at night or secondary enuresis when the patient has been dry and then begins bedwetting. There are a number of treatment options from the basic to more complex. Uh, things like limiting fluid intake, uh, going to the bathroom right before bed, uh, uh, can be helpful. But in many cases, bedwetting alarms that sense moisture and wake you up uh, can be helpful. Uh, and there are prescription medications such as uh, DDAVP or desmopressin uh, that can be used. Um, in older people, um, adults, uh, teenagers and adults, uh, if uh, bedwetting is noted, it is most likely related to an underlying sleep problem uh, or other medical condition. Um, if a teenager uh, comes into clinic and is complaining of bedwetting, nine times out of 10, that's sleep apnea. Okay, so I think we're going to wrap it up uh, here. Uh, we've covered uh, parasomnias that happen in non-REM sleep and other parasomnias. That leaves us with parasomnias that happen in REM sleep uh, or, or dream sleep. And so I look forward to telling you more about that uh, during our, uh, our next uh, session. Uh, I really appreciate your uh, attention, and I would be very happy to answer any questions that you you might have. It's been another incredible day of education hearing from some of the best minds in the nation in sleep and respiratory disease management. Hopefully you've been completing the evaluations for each lecture you attended. For each course evaluation you completed, you will see that course reflected on your certificate of attendance. To locate your certificate, Click on the account link in the left-hand vertical navigation, scroll to the bottom of the screen, and under Attendance Certificate, click Request New Certificate to download a certificate detailing all the CEUs you have earned. Also, your feedback regarding today's event is very important to us. Look for a survey in your email in the next few days. This education forum is for you, so let us know how we can make it even better for next year. And one final thank you to our speakers, sponsors, and DME partners. And an extra shout out to the MSC Planning Committee, co-led by Julie Banyas and Jen Wolking. We hope to see everyone again next year. That's a wrap.